What a field day for the heat down there A thousand people in the street Singing songs and they carry it time Mostly saying hooray for our side There's a battle lines being drawn Nobody's right if everybody wrong When people speak in their mind Getting so much resistance from behind We got to stop children, what's that sound? Oh, everybody looks good and down Everyone. This is Lauren Steiner, and welcome to the Super Bowl edition of the Robust Opposition. And I will tell you, I do not watch football, so I don't even know who won. You don't even have to tell me. I don't care. But I'm having a Super Bowl of my own with one of the great champions of public education, and that is Jackie Goldberg. She is going to be my guest for the entire hour tonight. How are you, Jackie? Oh, just fine, Lauren. Thanks for inviting me. Sure. So Jackie Goldberg is running for school board in uh, the 5th District of LAUSD, and I'm going to read a short bio about her before we get right into the questions. She was a student leader in the free speech movement at UC Berkeley. She taught for 16 years in Compton. She was on the LAUSD school board back in the 80s, the LA City Council in the 90s, the California State Assembly in the 2000s, and she had some of her accomplishments are creation of a district-wide K through 12 dual language education program, authorship of the first citywide landmark living wage ordinance, development of multiple housing initiatives that protect LA city renters, which we know is such a very important cause today, authorship of two statewide education bond issues, author of both the first citywide and statewide historic domestic partner legislation, Successful recipient of U.S. Department of Education Office of Ling English Language Acquisition five-year grant to improve the teaching of second language learners and narrow the achievement gap for African Americans and Latino students in the Compton Unified School District's middle schools. She was a faculty advisor at UCLA's Graduate School of Education and Information Studies for an additional three years preparing graduate students to teach middle and high school students in underserved communities. She is a member of, or uh, was a member of the Los Angeles Airport Commission and the chair of Mayor Garcetti's city targeted local hire working group. She was a co-founder of LACER after school program that serves as many as 4,000 schools, students annually at middle schools and high schools in central LA. Wow, what a bio. I am... <laughs> I hope that, you know, when I get to be your age, which is not too long from now, actually, there's no way I can have all those accomplishments. So I'm in awe of everything that you've done. And well, thank you. But, you know, nobody does any of those things alone. I've always had the most extraordinary staff. And I mean that quite sincerely. I'm not being humble. Having good staff means you get a lot more done. Well, having, knowing how to manage staff is an art <laughs> of itself. You know, not everybody okay. is good at that. So you must be good at it. Okay, um, I'll take that compliment. I've got a lot of activists who watch my show, and you were in the free speech movement, and that was in Berkeley in the 60s. Tell us what that was like for you and what your biggest takeaway from that movement was that you brought into your later activism. Well, you know, I really started the year before that in the civil rights movement in, the, in Northern California. I had tried to go south uh, for the uh, voter registration, but unfortunately, I was too young. They didn't want anyone under 21 because they didn't want you to end up in a, a place where they couldn't bail you out. So I got involved in the civil rights movement in the uh, demonstrations against the uh, discriminatory hiring practices of the Sheraton Palace Hotel which was like all of the hotels in the San Francisco industry. They didn't hire people of color in any positions where they'd be seen or where they could get tips. And so uh, a young African-American woman named Tracy Sims got a whole bunch of us to come over. And I was arrested there for the first time in 1963. So that really began my, uh, my being an activist. I had been somewhat of an activist in high school because of my best friend. But really, I was mostly just tagging along. 
it was really getting involved in civil rights that did it. Now in the free speech movement the following year came because of all of the activism of the students in the civil rights movement. And so the district tried to, the, 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 the campus tried to bar us from a place in front of the school at Bancroft and Telegraph where we handed out our leaflets and collected money and basically had political arguments between the various left, right and center organizations. When they banned that place, saying that there was a little metal piece in the ground that said this was actually a, a UC property and not Berkeley city property, uh, it created a movement which united the left, right and center in a way that nothing else could have. Uh, and so we began to, to take on the issue of whether or not students have any free speech rights. This was, you know, at the tail end of the McCarthy era, where there was all the uh, these uh, ad hoc uh, committees of Congress that were red squads that were investigating left wing students and left wing adults. Uh, the uh, state of California had a Republican majority in both of the houses, so they had their own Senate committee on uh, troublemakers like us. And so basically the for starting in uh, September and going all the way through December, we were involved in demonstrations and negotiations uh, with the university saying, look, when you cross over onto the campus, you don't lose your rights as an American. You don't lose your rights to free speech, to organize protest, to tell people what you believe in and that you want them to believe in it with you and to take action. And so uh, and finally uh, in December, uh, 800 of us got arrested after we sat in at the, uh, at the uh, Sprawl Hall, which was the main administration building. And that, uh, that arrest really was prompted by the fact that we thought that we had lost, uh, that they had decided that they were gonna give us sort of a mealy mouth, yes, you can, you can have free speech. But we thought we had lost when we went home and uh, for Thanksgiving. When we came back, they had sent four students, myself, my brother, Mario Savio, and a guy named Brian Turner, letters telling us that we were about to be expelled for our activities. Well, the movement decided that they didn't want to lose four of the people who had been in the leadership just because we had lost sort of the, the battle, and we sat in, 800 of us. Uh, with Joan Baez singing on the steps as we entered. And uh, it was a pretty scary arrest because I'd been arrested once before. This arrest was a little scarier because they kicked out the observers of the press. They kicked out the observers of the clerical people, the, the religious folks who had come to observe. Uh, they put newspapers over the windows so that the, nobody outside could see what was going on. And then they arrested the 800 of us. Wow. Well, I sure would have liked to have been there. I got arrested for the first time last summer. Oh, good. In the Sacramento Senate, I was live streaming the Poor People's Campaign disruption oh. of the Senate, and they targeted me because I was live streaming. I was the first one they pointed out. And it's a whole long story, but I do plan to sue them for false arrest. when Really? I get yes, because I think that's what they're doing. They're targeting media right now. Yes, I think you're right. And we have a new uh, McCarthy, I call Rachel Maddow, McCarthyite Maddow, because every night she's talking about Russia, 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 and fomenting this new, you know, Russia scare, which is so unhelpful. I mean, this is a country we ought to be getting along with. But I love, I would love to talk, I, we could do a whole show on this era, because I know yes. I could learn so much from you, but I want to get on to your um, next thing that you did, which was a young teacher in Compton. So you were teaching history and government and economics and all these really interesting subjects. I was a history major. I took all those classes in college. But now I'm noticing that those subjects are being eliminated in favor of, you know, uh, reading, writing, math, science, you know, everything is STEM. And what do you feel is lost for the students? I know what I feel is lost for the students by not having those kinds of subjects. What do you feel is lost by the students? And do you see that if you were to go back onto the school board, you could do something about that? Well, we haven't lost as much as you think. Uh, it, the biggest losses really, though, are in the elementary schools where they've expanded the time that the teachers are required to spend on reading and mathematics. 
But you have to read something. And in my view, they ought to be reading history. They ought to be reading geography. They ought to be reading social sciences and psychology. They ought to be reading a lot of things. I don't understand why people see this as one or the other. However, in the high schools, you're still required to take US history, world history, and government and economics. So that's pretty good. Middle school, it, it's touch and go, although most of the students do take eighth grade US history and some type of history in seventh grade as well. So we haven't lost it all yet. Uh, but I do think there is a trend to saying that drill and practice is what we need to be doing more of as opposed to thinking, reasoning, analysis, which is really what makes people get well, let's say empowered by education. It isn't just memorizing the dates uh, for a test. Uh, it's understanding what those dates mean, what that analysis meant. Why did this thing happen before that happened? Shouldn't it have happened the other way around? Who were the movers of this? Was it a movement or was it an individual? Was it a catastrophic event? Those things help people understand what's going on today because they help them develop the skills of analysis. And that's really, I think that, you know, I was preparing people who were largely uh, teachers of history uh, and, and uh, government and economics. And I will tell you that the young people coming into teaching, that at least the ones we saw at UCLA, are people you would definitely want your children to have as teachers. Would definitely? Yes, absolutely. Okay. They're unbelievably fabulous. Yeah. I mean, I was blown away by what they knew and by what their what their sentiments were towards their communities. Yeah. They understood that they were not tourists. They didn't come there and then drive home the minute the bell rang. These were people who were committed to getting to know the families of their students, to being involved in the communities they were teaching in, of being a supporter of parents and not dictating to parents. I mean, it was really quite a wonderful eight years I spent working with young people going into teaching. Now, when you were teaching in Compton, now that's an underserved population, poor, low income, community of color. Uh, what, what were the things that you did that most excited you that you saw really got results with your students? Well, we did two things. Uh, for the first part of my teaching career in Compton, what I enjoyed doing was just engaging them in the kinds of conversation and discussions that would help them build an analysis. Uh, but I had a class that was the only college prep class in one of the two schools I taught in in Compton. And we had a terrific time of really emulating a college class so that they wrote their essays in blue books. They didn't have weekly assignments. They had two big papers and so forth and so on. And that was pretty exciting for me. I really enjoyed that. But then when I was at Dominguez High School and we were the last going scoring school in reading, the bottom of the bottom of the bottom in the entire state, my principal let the chair of the English department and I develop a program called the Skill Saturation Program. And within three years of organizing that reading program across the, all the disciplines and getting all the teachers in our school to be involved in one way or another, we went from the bottom to the state average in three years. And I'm very proud of the work that we all did doing that. You know, one thing I wanted to talk to you about is citizenship, uh, civics. Because when I grew up, we had civics. And we knew about uh, even what it seems to me right now is that in order to learn this, you have to take AP government. And I was down covering the March for Education, you know, inspired by the Parkland students. And a couple of Fairfax High School students came up to us. We were doing some interviewing. I was with Pat um, Harris, who was a candidate for Senate, and he really wanted to talk to young people. And uh, this student actually said to me, I said, um, do you know who your representatives are? And she said, no, I don't know who my representatives in the Sine is. She did not even know that the word was pronounced Senate. She has never heard the word. You know how sometimes you read a word, but you, you've never heard it? And that was just heartbreaking to me because here she was clearly an active student. She cared enough about these issues to come down to this march, but she didn't know the basics. She didn't know who a U.S. senator was, who her congressperson was. I feel like you need to start this at a lower level. And there's a wonderful curriculum called um, Project Citizenship, Project Citizen. Uh, out of um, the Center for Citizenship Ed uh, Education. I'm, I may be mangling the name, but it's in Calabasas. 
and they it's project based learning so the kids democratically decide what is a problem in their community maybe there's a lot of accidents because there's no traffic light so they figure out you know who uh what agency in government they need to appeal to to get that traffic light and then they prepare for their testimony and then they go in and they do it and it's very experiential very project based and it gives kids a sense of how they can get involved in their community at any age you know even as children um what do you think of the idea of returning civics to education i know there's so much stuff you have to teach is this even possible oh sure well we do it already but we uh we do it mostly in the senior year and i think we need to do it earlier than that that is what the government class really does um you learn all of your elected people. You learn all of what they do. You learn who is a Democrat and a Republican. You learn what an independent is. You learn what people are who declined the state. Uh, most of us register all of them to vote. Um, most of them, uh, I always gave them extra credit for working on anybody's campaign, even if I disagreed with the person they picked. Um, we all, almost all of us gave them credit if they brought back a stub showing that their parents could vote if their parents were citizens. Uh, we talked about the issue of why parents can't vote in school board elections because that's something I thought that should happen and San Francisco's doing it. Uh, I think everybody who's a stakeholder should have a vote. And I don't care if they're citizens or not. They're letting us have their children every day, all day. They ought to be able to vote on who is making the decisions about them. So we do it, but we do it late. We do it in the senior year. Uh, and of course, some kids have left school before the senior year and never get it. Um, so I would I would go back to uh, putting some of it in middle school and some of it in elementary school, and I'd be happy to look at that curriculum and see what they do. Yes, and and the thing is, it's aligned with the state standards, so you don't yes. even yeah. Okay, so my next question is about um, let's see. Uh, right, I wanted to talk to you about integration because I was mm -hmm. at the a Network for Public Education conference in twenty seventeen. And the, this um, luncheon speaker was a reporter for the New York Times who got a MacArthur Genius Grant. And the results of her reporting was that the only thing that has ever been proven to decrease the gap in test scores between minorities and white students is integration. And the year that that gap was the smallest was in 1988, which is, was the heart of busing. Now, you were around during that time. I was actually living in Boston at that time with the famous Louise Day Hicks and all the racism and all the white flight because of busing. Now we know that there's really not much appetite for that. And even uh, people of color, educators of color, want to have community schools. So because our neighborhoods are not integrated, what do you think of that problem? Yes, we can have community schools, ideally, and we'll talk more about this later, fully funded community schools. Do you think that that's enough? Because the effect of this was not only to improve minority test scores, but to decrease racist attitudes on the parts of whites. I, I'm an absolutely solidly committed integrationist. Uh, my first teaching position was in Thornton Township High School in Harvey, Illinois. Uh, because I was getting my master's degree at the University of Chicago. I had been blacklisted because of my arrests, and so uh, Chicago wouldn't hire me, Chicago Public Schools. And so finally, on the first day of school, somebody didn't show up to teach ninth grade Illinois history at institutions in Harvey, Illinois, and they hired me. Uh, before the FBI could tell them not to do so. And so here I am, a Californian, still calling it Illinois, and uh, and teaching Illinois history and institutions. But here's what I what made me an dyed in the wool integrationist. The ninth graders that came into that school came from five segregated K-8 districts. I mean segregated. I'm talking there was a Polish district, there was a Dutch district, there was an Irish district, there was an Italian district, and there was a black district. And those five districts came together in the ninth grade with all the children because there was only one high school. And by the time, and the school did virtually nothing to encourage the students to learn to get along, to learn about each other. They were terrified of the white parents being angry at anything they might do. So they did nothing. 
And yet by the time they were seniors, the student body elected a black homecoming king and a white homecoming queen, which sent the white parents absolutely through the roof. So what I'm trying to say to you is, is that even without anyone promoting the idea of brotherhood and sisterhood and learning about each other and the positive things about diversity, just going to school together changed the attitudes. I won't say of 100 percent. I'm not naive, but of overwhelming number of students. And they would come to my class. I had one class that was a sixth period called Modern Problems, which was composed of all the students who had been put out of some sixth period class for behavior reasons. And they gave that to the new teacher to have all of the behavior. And we had a great time. It was my favorite class. And we talked about all of this. And they talked about how hard time they were having with their parents because they had changed and their parents hadn't and they didn't know what to do. So. What I'm saying to you is, so then when I come back to California and the school case comes up, that's really how I end up on the school board. We started an organization called the Integration Project. The White Valley parents called theirs Bus Stop and mm. said they represented white kids in the school desegregation case. And we intervened saying, no, 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 no. We represent the white kids because white kids want to go to school with everybody. They don't want to be isolated and segregated and have no idea what the real world is like. And so we got involved in that case. Through that court case, I became very knowledgeable of about all the schools in the district where there were empty classrooms, where there were opportunities for desegregating the schools with very short bus rides or really hardly any bus rides at all by just redrawing boundaries. Mm -hmm. And we began to develop plans to desegregate LA Unified. We had a plan finally called the Metropolitan Plan, which took in districts surrounding us like some of the ones on the East Coast did. So it wouldn't have been just LA Unified. And we, by the time we finished with our plan, we could within a 15 minute bus ride, 15 minutes, desegregate all the elementary schools, about, uh, no, pardon me, all the high schools, most of the middle schools, and about 75% of the elementary schools. Of course, then there was a ballot proposition put on that said that you can have all the desegregation you want, you just can't use buses to take the kids there. I said, fine, let's use trains, let's use helicopters, uh, let's use trucks. Uh, but they, they still we were defeated. But that is really the story about how I end up running for the school board. Because at the time, Kathleen Brown Rice marries Rice and leaves the board and goes to the East Coast because he's a, a NBC, I think, sports guy. And he's transferred to New York and leaves her seat open. And I run for that seat from the integration project base because we interviewed 14 or 15 people who wanted to run and none of them could say the word desegregation or integration out loud. Mm. They, they were unwilling to mention the words. So we turned on each other and I ended up being the candidate. And that was not something that was ever on my, my plate to do. But we found out that, we, that if we wanted to have some impact on these questions like what is an integrated school, because the district wanted to say an integrated school had to be 60% white. Well, that meant that, you know, nine schools would be desegregated. You don't need to have schools be uh, integrated with 60% white if you have African-American, Latino, Asian, and Anglo students all in the school and you have about 20 or 30% of each group. Um, and, and that's really what we tried to do. And that's how I ended up on the school board the first time was we ran a terrific campaign out in the in the uh, district knocking on doors and I defeated an incumbent. Well, now let's talk about your years on the school board before sure. maybe, maybe we'll get back to integration and the possibilities for doing that now, which seem very dismal. Yes. Um, I mean, I look at Palisades and I see that since they took that over, you know, first it became a charter, dependent charter, then it became an independent charter and the, the, it, the uh, percentages flipped. It used to be 70% Latino, now it's 70% white. And what I see is a lot of white um, middle class parents uh, using the charter school system to game it for so they don't have to pay for private school, which many of them could well afford. And I think that kind of contributes to why Steve Zimmer lost and Melvoin won. But that's kind of a. That and $10 million. Yeah. <laughs> 
That's kind I mean, of, you imagine that they spent nine point eight million dollars on that school board campaign. I mean, right. that's, that, that's a staggering amount of money. But well, then they again, got, they spent forty million dollars on Tuck, Marshall Tuck. Well, thank God we won that one. Really, uh, truly. You know, I was outside covering that charter school thing, and I'll talk to you about that later. But it was amazing to cover the remarks of Nick Melvoin. I mean, they really got their money's worth out of this. Oh, stuff. yes. And they're still getting it. He voted no on the resolution to ask for a moratorium for a while. Yeah. I mean, even the, he was the only no vote. I know. I mean, his, his he might as well have the word shill tattooed really? into his forehead. Truly. Bought and paid for. Bought and paid for. So um, talk about your, uh, I'm sure you had many, but why don't you talk about your, uh, what you, maybe your one or two greatest accomplishments on the school board when you were on it the first time? I think the biggest things that we did is that we, first and foremost, we modernized and brought up to date our bilingual program. And we made it possible for students to retain their first language while they were learning a second language by having a really, uh, really well done bilingual education program that was district wide. And it had the hopes, it had the hopes of having all the students be bilingual, not just those who started out with their first language other than English. Uh, I was very proud of that because we involved a lot of teachers. We a lot, involved a lot of experts, and we involved a lot of parents who had had lots of complaints about the previous bilingual education program, which often had a person teaching it who was not him or herself bilingual. And of course, it's very hard to teach anything that you don't know yourself. So we really did bring that up to date, and I was very proud of that. We also started, uh, Roberta Weintraub and I, uh, four school-based health clinics uh, that dispensed uh, prophylactics and, and birth control pills on campuses and pro provided health care, not just to the students who went to those four high schools, but to their families and the whole community. The other thing that I was very proud of that we did is we began emphasizing the need to have reading instruction in the secondary schools. Um, if a student really doesn't learn to read well, by the time they finish elementary school, basically middle school and high school teachers were never taught the first thing about reading because we were taught that everybody would come to us reading pretty close to grade level. And so one of the things that I was able to do was to get a whole lot of folks in middle and high schools to take on looking at their schools as to finding out ways on their own, within their own faculty, that they could reinforce and expand the reading skills of their students while teaching their subject matter, while teaching their subject matter. So those were, those were pretty big ones. We had uh, uh, some terrific, uh, we settled the teacher strike. Uh, I, was on, <laughs> I was on the board for that one. Uh, and, but more importantly, I think even than that, was that we were we were excellent at changing the beginning salary of teachers. LA Unified, when the first year I was on the school board, had 400 classroom vacancies on the first day of school. No teacher, no teacher, no teacher. I mean, people don't realize that that type of shortage happened, and it could happen again now. It could yeah. happen again now. So we had no teacher, and part of the reason we had no teachers, we had one of the lowest starting salaries. And by the time I was done working with my colleagues, we nearly doubled the starting salaries and we got rid of that problem altogether. And that was an important thing that I think we accomplished while I was there as well. Well, you know, I did want to talk to you about city council and state assembly, but I want to stay in the early 90s right now and stick with education because that was the time in 1992 when they first wrote, you know, the two different bills. One of them was Delane's, and the other one, I forget the guy whose uh, one actually got passed, but the Charter School Act of 1992. <clears throat> and um, I wanted you to talk about the history of that because my understanding was the first person who proposed charter schools was Albert Shankar, who was president of the American Federation of Teachers. Growing up in New York City, well, not New York City, in the suburbs of New York City, I used to read his column in the New York Times. And the idea of a charter school was to have innovative teaching methods and innovative curriculum. But the original Charter School Act in 1992 said that there would only be 100 schools in the whole state and only 10 in a city the size of Los Angeles. 
And over the years, those have all been eliminated and it's grown out, it's grown into a Frankenstein monster. But talk about what your feelings were about charter schools back then in 1992 and what you thought of them and what uh, LAUSD was doing about them or with them at that time. Actually, there weren't, I don't think any when I was on the board. Um, and that came after I left. I left in, in 90, uh, 83, 91. So I think it came oh. right after I left. Uh, one of the things, though, I will say is that Shanker then recanted his suggestion. And Diane Ravitch, who was one of the architects of all of this, has become the most important critic of charter schools because she's an honest researcher. Yeah. And she found that what she thought would happen was actually the opposite of what would happen. And that's because it was captured by the private billionaire privatizers. These are the same folks, you can name them. These yeah. are the same folks that want to privatize social security. Why? Yeah. Because their view is, is that every dollar should go to somebody's profit. Theirs. Yeah. No, nothing needs to be nonprofit, nothing. And you, and they look at schools and they say, oh my God, they spend a trillion dollars on that enterprise in a yeah. year nationwide. That trillion dollars should be coming to us. Now yeah. that is not the parent who makes a decision that this class size is smaller nearby uh, their school. That I don't blame them. You know, if I had a choice between a class size that was small and a class size that was 45, I'd have a hard time not putting a kid in a charter school. The problem is the legislation rigged it. Yeah. And that's what happened. What happened is, is that the money came in from the billionaires, the Eli Broads, the, the Reardons, the, the, uh, the guy from Netflix, the, uh, the yes. Walt, the Walton Family Foundation, okay. and then there's all these real estate agents who have all put money into it because the newest scam is is that charter school boards are stepping out of their role as charter school boards, self-appointed, not elected by anybody, becoming limited liability partnerships and going to Wall Street, buying property in the city of Los Angeles, building a school, and then when they decide they don't want to do this little game anymore, it that 100% paid for by taxpayer money is now owned by the limited liability partnership because they didn't put state money into building of it. Right. So now they've used public money to acquire prime property. And I can tell you that for a fact because I go to the Echo Park Neighborhood Council and the chair of it showed me one of the contracts where it shows in the bottom of it that it said, or this could become a, a market rate apartments. Mm. Or this could become, it says right in their charter, or this could become market rate apartments. Uh, so so what's happening is, is that, that those folks who are not educators, who are not interested in education, are capturing this and saying that schools should be market driven. No, yeah. they shouldn't. No, they shouldn't. Every kid is entitled to the great school. No, yeah. you don't say market driven. That kind of stuff is what you do when you don't want to have public education anymore and you want public money for private funds and to go to private people. Now, I want to be very clear about this. The average mom or dad or guardian who puts their kid in a charter school is not thinking about any of this. They don't wake up that morning and say, oh, let's screw the kids that aren't in charter schools. Yeah. But their decision, because of the way the legislation is written, impacts that. And here's a couple of examples. Let's say that you have an elementary school of about 500 kids and uh, 69 of them over a course of a couple of years leave the school and go uh, to char different charter schools. Okay. Do you pay less for the lights in the school? No. Do you pay less for the water in the school? No. Do you pay less for the electricity and the gas to keep it heated and cooled? No. Do you stop cleaning the bathrooms? No. Do you stop having people drive buses to and from the school if it's a receiving school? No. So you've lost 100% of the money, but you didn't lose anything like 100% of the cost. And that is why the class sizes keep going up when charter school enrollment goes up. 
it wasn't intended by the parent who put them in that charter school, but it was intended by the people who wrote the charter school legislation. Because their goal is to systematically undermine public education so the conditions get worse and worse so that more and more parents feel they have no choice. Right. except to put their kid in a charter school. However, yeah. don't have a child that has any emotional problems go because they will keep kick them out. Don't have anybody with a moderate or a severe uh, disability or special needs. Don't have any kid who doesn't speak any English. Yeah. Now, they, they, they're not unhappy if they come in with uh, being at what we call a, a middle level English, but not beginning English. Uh, don't be a child uh, who doesn't keep up with everybody in your class because these are the kids that these charter schools quote, counsel out. Right. They, they, they bring the parents in. I vi visited uh, because I had student teachers in some charter schools while I was at UCLA and I visited. And while I was at one high school, I literally saw a man tell a parent, we're not meeting your son's needs he needs to leave. Yeah. That's just un unconscionable. You don't tell a parent we're not meeting your son's needs. He needs to leave. You need to change your school to meet his needs. Right. Well, listen, there's a lot of issues that you, you brought up in that. And I want to talk about each one of them. Well, <clears throat> first of all, choice, market driven. These are all neoliberal terminology, right? And right. I, I heard the parents when I went to the um, school board meeting and I was outside, I was in the belly of the beast. I went right into that sea of charter school parents with their Kip shirts and all their other, you know, school logo shirts on. And I talked to them and I was very polite and very respectful and asking them why they sent their kid to a charter. But did you realize and, you know, kind of and they had no idea, of course. Like, right. Right. They don't know. But they were told to talk about kids choice you know choice for kids and choice is like no it's not a breakfast cereal it's not a commodity it's not where you go into the supermarket and you pick and choose a different school now what i have found when i was covering the relocation hearings i covered <clears throat> north hollywood high and hamilton high i live streamed both of those big meetings in the auditorium where the parents were worried sick because of prop 39 where they can take over empty classrooms but they can call a broom closet an empty classroom, a computer lab an empty classroom, a band room an empty classroom. They take over these empty classrooms and they you lose these facilities for the kids of the district school who really love those facilities. So they were worried sick about it. And the guy, I forget his name, it was a Latino name, it begins with a J, I wanna say Juan or Jose or whoever is in charge of the charter school division for LAUSD. He was there pitching LAUSD district schools like he was a pharmaceutical salesman. I swear, it was like, we got a school for you. And if you're in the performing arts, we got a school for you. And if you're in science, we got it. And I was thinking, no, no, why, why does it have to be like this? Why can't every school have everything in it? Fully funded schools that have everything in it. Why do we have to have these like boutique schools where Parents are like consumers of this product. It seems to have gone so awry that even the district is selling that concept. What, is, what are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, some of this comes out of the school desegregation case because when we lost the opportunity to transfer students to desegregate them, uh, the federal court said that we could use magnet schools. And magnet schools became specialized schools and students uh, could go there uh, and find an integrated setting. I sent my son to one for a while because I wanted him to be in an integrated school uh, and our neighborhood school would not have been an integrated school for him. So I understand that choice. Uh, and so what, what comes out of that, and you come out of, of course, of reproductive rights, we all talk about choice. And so if you are a billionaire, you can market anything. You know, I could probably tell you, I could sell you my thumb here. Here's my thumb. And if I had a billion dollars to market it, I could probably make it very attractive. And that's basically what they've done. They have an agenda, these folks, the, the, the privatizers. They have an agenda. They don't want elected school boards. They can't control them. So they have charter schools where the where the school board elects itself. It picks itself. You can't run against them. You can't recall them. You can't, in some cases, even attend their meetings because if they're a charter management organization, they don't even have to follow the Brown Act, which means open meetings. So 
and and the things that people don't realize is is that uh, there, there's one charter school group that has about 5,000 students in it, and the superintendent of that little charter school group makes $313,000 a year. Um, there are some charter schools whose uh, board members are the owners of the building they rent for their charter school, and they can charge any amount they want. They can charge any amount. They, they can pay a teacher anything they want. They can dismiss a teacher without cause, no matter how many years they teach there. And it's why they have a 50% turnover in faculty. People yeah. only teach in charter schools fundamentally because they can't get hired in a district school of any type because there's no openings. Yeah. I've noticed that all of this, not all, about 90% of the student teachers that I had that had to be in charter schools because there weren't openings have now all left for district schools yeah. because they want to be in a school district uh, where education, not profit, is the issue. Yeah. Well, you know, I was covering the strike at the accelerated charter schools, and we have yeah. Hilda Rodriguez Guzman, Guzman watching right now. She was a founding parent, and now she's a staffer, and she has a special needs child or grandchild, I can't remember which. Um, and I've been talking to her for months about the situation over there. And I interviewed those teachers. I sat in on the meeting with Curran Price. He was very helpful in negotiating that settlement. Right. I, even, I even spoke to Leonard Rabinowitz, who's on the board. He's like a, I'm sure he's a Trump supporting Republican. He's definitely a Republican. And I said to him, if you support Trump, don't tell me because I'm not going to be able to talk to you anymore. <laughs> But he really, you know, he was like, teachers need to be competing. Students need to be competing. And I, if you make me do binding arbitration, I would rather close the school. I close mean, the school. Yeah, the mentality. But those teachers, a lot of them were in district schools and they left because they wanted to have <coughs> smaller class sizes. They wanted to have more, less standardized testing. You know, they weren't all people that couldn't be in public schools. Oh, no, I didn't mean they weren't capable because they weren't competent. I meant there weren't any openings. Well, they. I'm, I talk to people that actually left. Districts. Yeah, no, I know. I, people have done that, but most of them have come back. Yeah. So so what do we do about that? So, Because I remember last year, Reggie Jones-Sawyer had that bill about transparency, accountability, the double dealing, that conflict of interest situation that you right. talked about. Right, right. And there are like neolibs, I call them neolibs, like Wendy Carrillo and Autumn Burke and all these people that we thought were progressive that are really progressive that take money from big oil, they take money from the charter school people. And they were saying it was that, that the, the, the teachers were greedy, that CTA was greedy. They were going after too many things. They were okay with the transparency. They were okay with the with the accountability, but they didn't want to get rid of that double dealing. And they wanted, you know, I was talking to Seth Bramble, he's the lobbyist for CTA. They wanted him to take that out and he was like, no. But meanwhile, Kathleen Carroll, who was fired as a whistleblower, I don't know if you remember her, but she said that the legislative analyst up there of the, of the legislature says that they are already supposed to be accountable for those rules. And they're just, and nobody's enforcing it. So, so part of the problem is, is that districts like LA Unified have too many charter schools to uh, administer, to 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 uh, hold accountable, and so they are often only visited once a year, and they're told in advance when they're coming, mm. uh, because they want them to provide certain data to them, so they don't want to have to sit around and wait. So, and they only go once a year. That's a big problem because some of these schools are doing some pretty disgusting things. Uh, I visited a charter school in a church uh, that used the balcony where the choir sang without partitions, had four classrooms. Mm. And my student teacher was supposed to be teaching in one of those classrooms. I had to take him out of that placement mm -hmm. because there was no way you could hear. I wouldn't have left a child in that school for a day. I think that charter school is probably still open today. Yeah. Uh, it's probably still open today. I mean, that's an unbelievable situation. So basically, the system is set up not to be monitored. Right. Uh, and it's set up not to be monitored because it's expensive to monitor them. And the schools have to pay a small amount to the districts uh, for that monitoring, but it is not nearly enough to cover the cost. And so actually they get away with just about anything they want to, unless on that one day they happen to get caught. Uh, and, and that's really a huge problem because there are some fine charter schools. I visited a few of them and they've been really, I've been 
quite impressed. They're very small in number. Yeah. Most of them are pretty much doing the same thing the other schools are doing, which is teaching to the test right. so that their test scores are high enough for them to say, we have better test scores than school Y. Yeah. Come to us. And, and you know, that wasn't true at the beginning. I knew uh, some folks that did some charter stuff at the very beginning of this, and they were avoiding teaching from the test. And they did involve their teachers in decision making. All that's gone. It's just gone. It's become an industry now and it's all about making money. And it's all about saying that my product is better than your product. Leave that product and come to mine. And it's all being funded. And why are those legislators so chicken? They're so chicken because there's so much money involved. When you spend $40 million on a superintendent of public instruction race, you know that the people who are doing this have so much money, they don't care how much they spend. Well, when you spend $10 million to get rid of a decent man who was the school board president at the time and who actually was working to try to mediate between charter schools yes. and the district schools. And when you lie about him with $10 million of the most disgusting lies uh, and, and nobody seems to care about that. When you become an assembly member like Laura Friedman with charter money, and then that's all she ever does is protect charter schools. Oh when you have the governor of the state ha who runs two charter schools, vetoing any charter legislation, as Jerry Brown did. Jerry Brown vetoed a bill that would have required charter schools to provide free and reduced lunch at their campuses if well, they had low income kids. And and I called him up on that and, and then you know what he told me? He said, charter school operators know what their students need. If they need it, they'll take care of it. Yeah. Well, let me ask you, what do we do about this? Because you, when you and I last spoke at, uh, at a meet and greet for you in Pasadena a couple of weeks ago, you said you don't feel that we can repeal the Charter School Act of 1992. Um, let's but talk I do think we can change it. Yeah, let's talk about what we can do. See, I personally, my son went to Westwood Charter, which is an affiliated charter. And I know I have friends in the movement, Sarah Roos, who had a fundraiser for you, who is adamantly against any charter, even affiliated charter, as is Jeff Pott, who's a friend of mine, who is a former teacher and union leader. He calls them charter businesses. He says any, even a dependent sc uh, school is exempt from certain things in the ed code. They can get waivers. So he's opposed to them. But I thought it was a wonderful school. I had my kid, this was before I was an activist, and I didn't know about charter schools and what they were doing, but I had one son in private school. He was at the lab school at UCLA, and then I had my other son at Westwood Charter. And I got to tell you, I actually liked Westwood Charter better than the lab school. They were doing everything that the private schools were doing. They were doing project-based learning. They had the, when they were teaching, um, you know, uh, uh, losing the word, you know, when you come to the country, um, rural? No, no. Uh, like um, citizen. Like when the citizens came from immigrants. The, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm just forgetting that name. But when they had that lesson, they turned the entire auditorium into Ellis Island. I see. And they had the kids dressing up, and they had the one station where you would go and you would get the medical treatment, and the other thing where you would write your name, and that's where they were changing the people's name because they couldn't spell their real name, and it was like just education was coming alive. And they had, you know, they had groupings with the three, the four and the five. And they had the teachers, they ended school early on Tuesday. So the teachers could meet and talk in families. And, you know, it was just such a wonderful school. So my feeling is, why couldn't we make all charters dependent so that they are accountable to a publicly elected school body like LAUSD, which we know is captured right now, but hopefully we'll change that. And that they have to hire unionized teachers and that these teachers have to pay into CalSTRS, which the charter school teachers currently don't have to do. They're, thereby, they're worried that it's going to be, there's not going to be enough money. The more teachers that, you know, are in charters, the less money there is in the pension fund. Is that possible? And how do we do that? I don't think it's possible. Oh. I, well, it, 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 I think it will eventually be possible. Because the worm is turning. The charter school candidate in this race, I just got her first leaflet, doesn't use the word charter anywhere in it. The word charter does not appear in her leaflet. Is this in, Heather? In all of our, huh? Is 
this Heather? This is, this is th no, this is Allison Greenwood. Oh, okay. Uh, so one. Bajraya. Yeah. Okay. She she teaches at Camino Nuevo. She's a she's the charter person. Uh, though, some people think some people think Heather is too. Um so far, Heather that's a that's a question mark for me. I don't know if that's true or not. Yeah. I know that she has some connections to charter that run pretty deep, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's where she is. I don't really know, but I know there is one person who is definitely a charter person and she has not mentioned the word charter in any of our forums that all of us have appeared in. So the worm is turning. Why is the worm turning? The worm is turning because people are having their children kicked out because yeah. people are, are finding out only Blin policies because they're finding out that there's a charter school that's a charter high school that a whole lot of people were sending their kids to in my neighborhood that didn't meet all of the requirements to get their kids into a four-year university when they graduated. Wow. So people are learning that they're not all what they were cracked up to be. Uh, Diane Ravage's new book, which is about to come out, says that nationwide charter school students in only 15% of the charter schools do better than the the traditional public schools. In 85% of the charter schools, they either do the same or worse right. than the district schools. So yeah. it isn't because they've been winning and doing so well. It's because they have so much money backing them that they've made people who would regulate them afraid. But here are some of the things we can do. Okay, We can change the definition of what an empty classroom is. OK, to say that it is used for any purpose by that school on a regular basis, like a reading lab, like a math lab, like a science lab, like a computer lab, like a music room, like a band room, like an instrumental music room, any kind of purpose, like a place for the traveling uh, special ed teacher to come that does speech therapy. Uh, I, I saw a charter school take that classroom and that speech therapist now meets with her her clients on the landing between the first and second floor oh. of the main building. That's where she does her work now because she lost her classroom because it was declared empty. So Good. we can change that. We can change whether or not co-location can be stopped. We can change whether or not a school district can decide for sure where that charter school once chartered will be located. We can change legislation that says that Charter schools do not have to publish the salaries of all of their employees and particularly the higher paid ones. We can change the legislation that says that they can counsel out a student without going through a hearing process like any other school who is getting rid of a student. So there are reforms we can make that can make them more like public schools, but there's still, in my opinion, too much money around to throw at legislators to, that, to, to keep them from going much further than that. Now, I do see a day when we will go further than that. But even the changes I'm talking about would make a big difference. You should not be able to charter a school except in your own district. And right now there are two schools that were chartered in Victorville that are in LA Unified. Mm. So, you, you know, the, the State Board of Education in Sacramento has chartered schools in LA Unified. Are they, are they monitoring them? Well, of course not. Nobody's monitoring them. Um, so there are things that we can change and we can change right now because the worm is beginning to turn. People are beginning to see that what you have when you have a charter school is a private school at public expense without any really measures that will keep that public money being spent exclusively on the needs of the students. And that, that people are getting. And I think we can make some big changes now, but not all of what I want. Uh, what you're suggesting is I haven't heard before. I think that's a very interesting idea. I don't have any problem with that. But really, bottom line, bottom line, bottom line, bottom line, bottom line, California is 43rd in what we spend per student. Yeah, we need per, more per pupil per year. Right now, we're spending about $12,000. New York is spending 22000 if we're spending 22000 there aren't any charter schools. There aren't any charter schools because our schools will have small class sizes and librarians and nurses and counselors and psychiatric social workers. There'll be an extra uh, assistant principal. There'll be enough teaching assistants. There'll be enough people who are keeping the grounds clean and the bathrooms clean and the grounds cleared. There'll be all the things that schools need to have in order to really educate a population that is largely 
second language learners, largely kids of color, largely low income kids. And isn't it interesting that we cut off the funding for public schools just as that population changed? It's all about racism. It's right. all about not seeing the kids that are currently in public schools as valuable. And the charter school monsters that I talk about, these privatizers, not the ones that run the individual school, not the parent who puts their kid in the school, but the billionaire class. What they really want is they want to have a racially and ethnically integrated ruling class. Yes. So that people will stop bugging them about being all white men. Right. Okay. And once they've done that, then they don't care if anybody ever goes to school again. Right. Well, my fear with these charter schools and, and so why so many tech people, Steve Jobs and now his widow, Bill Gates, the Pearsons, they would like to have kids sitting, learning from tablets, and the teachers would be a minimum wage classroom manager just keeping right. order. And we have charter schools like that now. We have a couple of charter schools like that now. They're actually trying to teach preschool like that, which to me is not only educational malpractice, it's child abuse. I agree with you entirely. Because children, I agree with you entirely. Yeah. So how do you think we can, as an activist, um, and I'm working with the new California Progressive Alliance, which is the outgrowth of Gail McLaughlin's campaign. Uh, uh, uh. We're working with all the issue groups. We're going to have our founding convention at the end of March in San Luis Obispo. And we want to get the affordable housing people working with the people fighting education privatizer. And we want to get the anti-fracking people working with the single payer people. And we want to work together because Grover Norquist gets the right wing. He has meetings in his office every Wednesday and he gets all these groups together, the gun rights people and the pro-life people and he gets them all to sublimate their and you know agendas and they all speak as one big voice but of course the right wing republicans are very authoritarian they're sort of used to taking orders that's why they love donald trump left wing you know we like to debate we like to be democratic and it's impossible for us to get anything done how do you see do you see we put together like because one of the things that i'm working on for this group is a legislative action team and we want to do model legislation like a citizen's ALEC. So yeah, in, the yeah, way, yeah. in the same way that the nurses union wrote SB 563, right, right. do you see that we do like a suite of educate, like a suite of bills and we find one legislator who's really going to fight for it, unlike Ricardo Lara, who did not fight for single payer, but, um, or do we take each one, one a year? How do you see this ha happening? Well, I think the changes in the charter school stuff uh, comes beginning now uh, because I've asked both uh, uh, Tony Atkins, who's a pro tem of the Senate, who's endorsed me, and I asked uh, uh, Anthony Rendon, who is the uh, uh, the speaker of the of the Assembly. I've asked them both to uh, to to appoint um, sta not standing committees, but special committees to which we do from time to time in the legislature to look at a piece of legislation that has been around for a while and to see what its impacts are. And so uh, Rendon has already agreed to appoint one of those committees, a select committee they're called. And I'm, I'm gonna try to get Tony Atkins to do the same because what we really need to do is to have a select committee of Democrats and Republicans who look at the actual outcomes of what is going on with charter schools under the current legislation. What happens when you lose 100% of the money but not 100% of the costs? What happens when you declare that a, a computer lab is an empty classroom and then the charter school takes over that classroom, puts computers back in it and then tells the parents of the uh, district school that if you want the computer lab again, you have to take your kid out of the district school and put them in the charter school school across on the other side of the campus. So so those things are happening right now. And I think we can make those kinds of changes because I do think that the worm is turning. I think people are beginning to see that there is more afoot here when you talk about charter schools than just whether or not you personally, Lauren, had the opportunity to put your kid in a pretty classy charter school. Okay. I, I have, I've said from the beginning, my problem is not with the parent making that choice. My problem is with a system that's rigged so that that choice automatically undermines 
the possibilities of a positive educational experience for 80% of the kids in this district. Right. And that cannot well, be allowed to continue. Well, you know, what you said is like after my son was at Westwood Charter, he was next to go to Emerson. And I have a question about this because I covered settlement day. I went to Emerson Middle School because I was making a series of videos on the strike. I did one at Accelerated. I did one at Westwood Charter. And then I went to um, Emerson when they had their three hours to vote on it, which I didn't think was very fair. But, you know, they were talking. The science teacher was saying, you know, the settlement didn't really help me because it doesn't affect this school. Um, I'm still going to have 45 kids in my science class. And how can you teach science, which is hands on effectively with 45 kids? That's why I did not chose, choose to send my son to Emerson. This was, again, before knowing about charter schools and being an activist on the issue. It was purely because, you know, there were too many kids in the classroom. So I sent him, I sent him to Bridges because he has special needs, Bridges Academy, which was for twice exceptional kids in North Hollywood. And then for ninth grade, he went to Pacific Hills. And Pacific Hills had a man by the name of Peter Temis who had written a lot of books on education and, and teaching. And he actually said to me, Lauren, how can you, who can afford to send your kid to private school, tell a poor black mother in South LA that she cannot send her kid to a charter school if that charter school has 24 kids in a classroom and a laptop on every desk? And I said, Peter, you're asking me the wrong question. Why doesn't every public school have 24 kids in, in a classroom and a laptop on every desk? Now that goes to full funding. So before I go to the settlement, I want to stay on the state level a little bit and ask you about that. So we know that Prop, um, that Prop uh, 13 was why uh, the, uh, the schools lost money, because it was to keep seniors in their homes. But there was this big commercial loophole for big companies, like Disney is still paying the same amount of tax in Anaheim on a huge complex that they paid in the 1960s. So they have this piece of legislation. They qualified it for the 2020 ballot. You know that the corporations are going to spend heavily against this. Ah, uh, don't be so sure. Remember, at least half of the corporations in California don't get Prop 13 benefits. And their competition has them because they came after 1978 to California. Uh -huh. So there are a huge number of businesses who will benefit from getting rid of Prop 13 for businesses. Uh, I've met with them. I know who some of them are. They are excited about this ballot proposition because they are paying 21st century taxes and their competitors are paying 19th century, yeah. 20th century taxes. And they don't think that's a bit fair. Some of them even sued in court against it uh, yeah. and didn't win, but they, but they've brought lawsuits against Prop 13. So don't be so sure that all the money is going to be uh, against this. I think it will pass easily, frankly, to be very honest with you, but that's not all we need. We really need to be re-examining the entire tax structure of California. And one of the things that people don't know or didn't remember is, is that two years after in 1978 came 1980 and on that statewide ballot, Jarvis and Gann put the two thirds vote for a budget and two thirds vote for changing tax law. Yes. That means that if you don't have two thirds in each house, I don't care how many progressives you have, you're not going anywhere. Yeah. Uh, I was given the opportunity to look at changing our tax structure when we thought at night in 2004 that we might get up to two thirds. We didn't even come close, but there are two thirds there now. And this is one of the things I tell all activists. Now is the time to tell your legislator, yes. your senator and your assembly member that we have done something nobody else has done. We gave you a blue wave and we gave you a two thirds vote in both houses. Now use it to change the tax structure, tax the real wealth of this state. This yeah. state, if it were a nation, is the fifth richest state in the world. So you say uh, United States, China, Japan and Germany, California is number five. There is no excuse 
no excuse for be us being 43rd in that. There's no excuse that we do not have health care for all in California. Yes. There is no excuse that we have a crumbling infrastructure. There is no excuse for that except that two-thirds vote. Now that two-thirds vote is not an excuse. And I'm telling every Democrat, if you don't do something about it, now that we've given you two-thirds, we are coming after you next. You know, I'm smiling because you're reminding me of the female Bernie Sanders of California. <laughs> I mean, what you're talking about is so awesome. I'm, and I'm also thinking AOC, we need to have that 70% marginal tax rate. We need to have a bill for that. So I'd love to talk to you <clears throat> more about this stuff offline. But, you know, we've gone an hour. I still have a bunch of questions. Can you stay a little bit longer? Just a little bit. Okay. A little bit. I have to say that I, I started very early this morning, about 7 a.m., and I'm getting just a little fatigued, so I hope we can finish fairly soon. All right. Well, I'm going to tell you the questions that I wanted to ask you about, and I'll let you pick the ones that you want to answer. Okay. okay. Fair enough. So I wanted to talk to you about um, the settlement, what you thought of it. Uh, I wanted you to talk about librarians, because one parent in this parent-teacher group wrote... Um, it shouldn't be for high school, secondary school. It should be librarians for lower school because that's when they develop a love of reading. And my kid only goes to the library once a month and she rereads that book over and over. And that was just heartbreaking to me. So yeah. librarians, um, special ed teachers, they apparently got nothing in this settlement. Um, <clears throat> health benefits. Oh, I just was going to ask you why you feel like UTLA and CTA didn't strongly support uh, SB 562, because if we had single payer, then uh, there would be le more money for teacher's salary or c more teachers because they wouldn't have to spend money on the health benefits. The uh, district has done a study on what would happen if we had med uh, 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 a single payer system. They would save $400 million a year. So Four, that that's that's four thousand teachers. So why is that's four thousand teachers? Why is I don't know. I you know I I don't I don't know their politics. I don't know how they they make decisions. Maybe they saw there wasn't enough support for it, and to spend a lot of energy on it was use futile, and they wanted to develop the support before they did it. I don't know. They didn't discuss it with me, and I don't know. What I will say to you is that we have two thirds in both houses in, the, in, in Sacramento. And there are a heck of a lot of people who wanna do a heck of a lot of good legislation now. And yeah. we just have to be on their case to make sure that they do that. Um, that's the truth of the matter. There is wealth in this state yet to be taxed. And that wealth can change the outcome for the average human being and the low income human being and the middle income human being in California. And we need to be doing it. Right. Well, that's we need to have the political will for that. And we need to push these people because a lot Absolutely. of them, a lot of them are d mod Dems, you know, and they're not. Um, uh, but mod Dems need the money from the progressive Dems to win. I used to have to raise money for all of the Central Valley Democrats because nobody was raising money for them. And then they never voted on one of my bills. Why did I do that? Because they made it possible for me to chair the assembly education committee because we were in the majority. So I think people have to get, become a little more nuanced as they look at why people in elected office do some of the things. I got criticism for people who said, why am I sending money to this terrible person in the Central Valley? I said, if that terrible person weren't a Democrat, uh, I wouldn't be chairing assembly education committee because if we're not in the majority, you don't get to be a chair. Yes. So yes. I think I, I just saying that that this is a complicated system. And that's why I do believe we need more civics education. People need to understand it better yes. Then they then they can be the drivers of legislation and not those that are currently the ones who are driving. it. OK, two points on what you OK, this is what I want to talk about. Two questions. I want to talk about your priorities. Well, actually, three questions. The last question is going to be how people can help you. <laughs> but what your priorities are when you get elected, and also to discuss your opinion of uh, Austin Butner's portfolio plan. I Good. heard him. On, I'll take those two. Okay, I heard him two. talking about on KPUC, KPCC. He was basically saying. Oh, you know, the district is too much bureaucracy. We have to break it up and get rid of some of these mid-level managers. 
And really, uh, you know, the conditions in San Fernando Valley are very different from the conditions in South LA. So if we broke them up, we would be able to have the schools to be more customized for the location. But I feel like the teachers union don't believe that. They think that this is just sort of coming out of his finance background. No, it's not even that. This is the national privatizers plan. Okay. The portfolio plan has been put into effect in Atlanta, in Denver, in Chicago, in Newark, and now they want to do it in Los Angeles. It's a very simple plan. It says that you're going to divide up the schools you're, and then you're going to give them a score they have to reach. If they don't reach it, you close their school and you give it to a charter school. It's a yeah. very simple plan. And the students in Newark were so furious at the school closings that they sat in the superintendent's office until he finally quit. He resigned because the students would not leave his offices. Wow. They were tired of having their neighborhood schools closed and they simply went in and occupied his office. My right. sister-in-law is in Chicago and has just retired a year or two ago from her 30 some year teaching. And they're closing schools where? On the South side and on the West side. And they're replacing them with charter schools. Charter schools that don't have to take all the kids of the school that just closed. Charter schools that are not necessarily interested in the student. You froze. Jackie, can you hear me? Can you, if you can hear me, maybe you should go out. Well, let me drop you out and see if I can bring you back in. Hold on a second, guys. I lost her. Okay, now she's not down here. Let's see. Uh-oh. Darn it. And I know she's not tech savvy. Um, damn, this is such a good interview. Uh, hopefully, the staffer who is with her will help her get back in. But if she doesn't... If she cannot get back in, I'm going to have her back on uh, to talk about the rest of this. And then I'm going to edit it. I'm going to edit the second part to this part and upload it to my YouTube channel because this is fascinating. I mean, this is an amazing woman, folks. Um, I'm putting up her website here, JackieGoldberg.org, and that's where you can go to volunteer on her campaign, to donate to her campaign. I think from listening to this interview, you are going to get the idea that the charter schools even though they have said they have not picked a candidate, uh, Jackie's pretty sure it's going to be this woman, Allison. Um, it is very important for us to get Jackie. Okay, she's back. I had an electrical disturbance, and yeah. now we're back, we're back in, in power. <laughs> okay, I was just telling them about your website and why it's very important to go and sign up to volunteer and donate. And, you know, we got to get you in. And I was going to talk about the, um, you know, the, the fact that if you can get more than 50%, 51%, there's not going to be a runoff. Right. Uh, why don't we you talk about this election and what you're up against and what you really need people to do? Okay. Okay. Um, well, there are ten people in the uh, in the in the race. Um, I would say uh, six at least uh, will not have enough resources to make a real campaign out of it, and some of them are really excellent. Uh, but because it's a special, it's a short time. It's about sixty days that you really get to talk to the public about the election, and even as we knock on doors of people who vote in every election, we're finding that people don't realize that there's an election in March. So that's our first goal: is to just let people know there's an election. So basically, uh, of the ten people, it is three Anglo women uh, who are largely uh, in the lead. Uh, that's Heather Repenning, who is being solidly backed by the mayor and all of the mayor's connections and contacts, and he, she has the most money, and on and on and on. And her name is Heather Repenning. And then there is the charter school person, and that's uh, um, Allison Greenwood 
Bajraya, I hope I pronounced her last name correctly. She doesn't even use that last name very often because it, it's her husband's name, actually. And he's uh, uh, East Indian, and I understand a fine fellow. Uh, but Heather uh, has her child uh, at Ivanhoe School. And uh, Allison has her child at, Fra at uh, Franklin. And those are the two highest income areas of the board district five. Uh, so they're probably going to chop each other up a bit as to the charter parents and the folks that like public schools as long as they can raise several hundred thousand dollars a year to make it more like a private school. Yes. Um, um, Allison Greenwood at least knows something about education. I don't think Heather does. She's running basically on being young and a parent and who's going to run again in 2020. Um, she's accusing me of being too old. I want to remind her that a lot of us still love uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and uh, Nancy Pelosi and uh, Dolores, Dolores Huerta and a few others of us who are seniors. But, you know, I think experience counts for a lot in this particular race. And that's really how I got into it is because uh, the people running really, except for Allison, have had very little experience. Well, that's not true. There's a principal from a South Central school that I, I like a lot that is probably not going to do very well, but she's very good. Uh, so that's that's basically it. Now, how do you win 51 percent with 10 people on the ballot? Well, I've represented about 80 percent of the voters in this district for 22 years. So I have vastly superior name recognition. What that means is, is that when you see 10 names on a ballot and it's the only thing on the ballot, a whole lot of people are going to pick the only name they recognize. Um, that's for me, wonderful news. Uh, our polling as we uh, knock on doors and phone and text is very high. We are well above 45%. However, we need to get to 50%. So we hopeful that we will get some of those votes in the south part of the district, which is uh, Bet, uh, Cudahy, Bell, Vernon, Maywood, uh, Southgate, Huntington Park. Um, I think those are the biggest ones. There might be some small, Bell Gardens has a little bit of it. Uh, but we have very good support from Padres Unidos in Southgate. We have very good support uh, from a bunch of teachers that I picketed with during the strike who are all now walking precincts in their area. And we have very good support from some folks in Bell, including the mayor of Bell, Fidencio Gallardo, um, and Alicia, whose name last name I should know by now, but I can't remember. She's a city council member there. So we're hoping that if we can get maybe 4% uh, of the 51% there, that we might be able to get 47% up in the part that I represented all those years and pull this off. I think it's a long shot. I think we have only about a 35% chance of that. But if the people watching this decide they want to walk a precinct or come to one of our text nights or come to one of our um, uh, phone banks, or if they want to host a meeting for me to meet people in their community who have never heard of me and who don't know me because they moved in recently, yeah. Uh, to these neighborhoods. I'll be happy to come and they can find how to do that by going to JackieGoldberg.org, JackieGoldberg.org, our website, or our Facebook, Jackie Goldberg for School Board. And you'll find in both of them ways that you can connect up with the campaign and say, hey, I'd like to have her come to my house. I know a bunch of people in the neighborhood who don't know her and they we would like to have her come. We also need money. Uh, although I will say I've never had the most money in any race that I've run in and I've never lost an election. So, But you do need to get to the amount you need to get your stuff out. And so if people want to contribute, they can do that both at the Facebook page, but easier on the website, JackieGoldberg.org. Okay, great. Now, one final question, because I didn't ask you about your priorities. How can you do a show with a candidate and not talk right. about what their priorities are? It kind of is entwined with my question about why are you doing this? I mean, you're of an age yeah. where you be enjoying your retirement. Truly. Yeah. <laughs> really? I'm doing it for one, one, one most important reason. I have the best chance of preventing there being four charter school board electees on the board. Uh, they are not good for the district. Uh, they may think they are, but they aren't. And they refuse to put a parcel tax on the ballot when they could have. 
even though they had a poll showing it had 67% approval before there was a campaign, but the charter schools wouldn't have gotten the money if it went from a parcel tax to the district. So they voted not to put the parcel tax on. And yet Proposition W for water got 70% of the vote. So we know that their heart is about what their heart is about. And that's fine for them to do that. But when they run the district, they run 100% of the kids in schools, not just the charter schools. And they're not particularly interested in that. And it makes me very nervous. So that was my primary motivation was to not have a fourth vote again, like Ref Rodriguez, who then picked Butner as superintendent, a man with no educational experience or background never taught a day in his life, never provided a service in, in, in a school in his life. Uh, and I think maybe a terrific guy or not a terrific guy, I don't really know, but he's certainly not an educator. And I don't think that people who aren't educators should be running the second largest district in America. Yes. So my priorities are very simple, to keep this seat out of the hands of charter schools. Uh, they have three, that's enough. Uh, secondly, to begin to lead that wave of human beings that love their teachers so much that they were willing to go out in the rain and pick it with them and bring them food and let them use their bathrooms and their homes while they were picketing and so forth and so on. What, there were thousands and thousands of parents supporting, and not just parents, just community members supporting the teachers in their strike. It was truly amazing. I wanna gather that momentum back up and take it to Sacramento and tell them it's time to change the tax laws and to fully fund public education in California. So that's one of my priorities. Another priority is to prevent the portfolio plan from going into effect. I think that it has been a disaster in Chicago. It is becoming a disaster in Denver. And I think it will be the death knell of most of what we call public education in Los Angeles. And I think that's why the privatizer billionaires are in favor of it. Yeah. My set, third one is to take, have, require the district to do an immediate assessment of how much per pupil uh, schools are getting that are the district's public schools to ensure that there is equity. I know that I've been spending a lot of time in the Southeast area cities and they feel dramatically that they are underfunded compared to other parts of the district. I have no way of knowing that. I want an audit done and I want to find out if that's true. And if it's true, we need to correct that immediately. I want to also be a voice on that school board for telling the state legislature it is time to have select committees review charter legislation and become very, very clear very, very clear about the impacts. And if there are positive ones to keep them, and if there are negative ones to change the legislation to get rid of those negative impacts. So those are my key priorities. If I win, I will have my main office in the district office that serves the Southeast cities because I feel that they have had too little contact with their board member who lives up in the northern part of this, uh, of this district. Mm -hmm. um, and I plan to be very active in visiting schools because I did that when I chaired Assembly Ed and I found out a lot about public education in California just by going in and sitting in, in classrooms. So I will be doing a lot of that as well. Well, you know, I'm sold, but I was sold when I went to the last meet and greet and I've told your campaign manager that I want to host a fundraiser. Thank you. you. So anyone who's watching, I've got a great house in Benedict Canyon in the hills. And if anyone, people love to come here for fundraisers, you're all invited. I'm going to put it up uh, as soon as I can work out a date. I'll put it up on my Facebook page. But Jackie, uh, I wish you all the best because you are fantastic. I mean, thank you. The show was great, and I want everybody to share the show on your Facebook page. If you're in any groups at all in Los Angeles, share it there. And um, what can I say? You're fantastic. I'm going to let thank you go you. so I can promote my next show. Okay. Well, thank you, Lauren, for inviting me. And I promise that if you'd like me to come back and answer questions that we didn't get to tonight, I'll be happy to do that. All right. Thanks a lot, Jackie. Get some rest. Thank you. That will be good. Okay. Good night. Good night. All right. That was Jackie Goldberg, folks. She's running for school board in District 5 here in Los Angeles. We got to vote for her. We got a canvas for her, phone bank for her, text bank, whatever. You know, the full-on Bernie Sanders, right? Because I don't know if you were listening since the beginning of this interview, but she goes back. I want to mention that while she was there in the free speech movement in Berkeley, 
trying to, uh, or where she said she was integrating um, school. When was she integrating? I already forget. It was an hour and a half ago I asked her this question. But Bernie was doing the same thing in University of Chicago, integrating school housing. So there you go, a real activist. This is the activist candidate. I love to represent the activist candidate for whatever office they're running for. She is clearly the activist candidate. Now, next Thursday, I'm gonna be doing a show also on education, and I'm gonna be interviewing Mike Hutchison, who is the lead organizer with OPEN. The, um, it's the public at, uh, Oakland Public Education Network, I think it stands for, but he is the main mover trying to fight privatization in that city. Uh, although that city has fewer number of charter schools, they've got a greater percentage of kids in charter schools than even LAUSD, which has one out of 20. So their teachers have voted to go on strike. Um, we need to help them. We need to show solidarity from Los Angeles and all the other cities when the Oakland teachers go on strike. So if you want to know about that, that's going to be right here on my Facebook page Thursday at 7 p.m. So until I see you next, keep fighting.